Hello students, hope you're all doing well. So students, this is going to be the last video which is related to the first module of International Business Dynamics. If you remember, in my previous video, I had stopped it here where I told we will be discussing these models in the next class. So today's session is going to cover the models to aid international managers. And one more thing, by this particular video, we will be completing, officially completing the first module of IBD. In my next session lecture video, I will be sending you the contents pertaining to module two. Okay, so let us start with the models. So here, the models to aid international managers is basically a topic wherein we will be discussing the various models, okay, which has been the researched efforts of a lot of people who have contributed to this particular subject, whereby they help us understand various dynamics, various aspects which are to be considered when we place ourselves in foreign countries in order to carry out our business operations. Okay, Majority of these models are purely to do with the social and cultural aspects that are being covered with special reference to human beings. Okay, so let us see what these models are one by one. The first model is going to be Hostiates Cultural Dimensions. The second is Edward T. Hall Study of Cultural Dimensions. The third is Globe Cultural Dimensions. The fourth model is Clocon and Stradbrook's Cultural Dimensions. And the last is Trompena's Cultural Dimensions. So we will be discussing each of these models one by one. Let us go for the first model that is Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Now, this particular model is basically something which gives us a nutshell or a framework for cross-cultural communication that takes place between people belonging to different cultural backgrounds, okay, which was basically developed by Greed Hofstede. Now here, what basically that we are going to understand is this model describes the effects of society's culture on the values of its members and how these values relate to behavior using a structure derived from factor analysis. Okay, so this is probably one of the very practical ways of measuring cultural aspects and cultural dynamics that takes place between people who come from different cultural and geographical backgrounds. Okay. So Gerard Hendrik, who's, that is Greed Hofstede, is basically a person who's from Dutch. He was a social psychologist and he was a former IBM employee, that is in the year 1967 to 1973, and he's also a professor. Okay. Now, as of this particular model is concerned, it simply means that this gentleman, that is Hofstede, basically is trying to give us a definition about the nation, the national culture. Okay. So what is national culture? National culture is nothing but it is a set of collective beliefs and values that distinguish people of one nationality from that of the other, which is nothing but we are talking about collectivism, that collective set of beliefs and values that people have, which is completely contrasted and differentiated between people belonging to one particular nation in correspondence to people belonging to the rest of the nations or other countries, right? That is what is the crux or the main element of this particular model, okay? And see, this person that is Hofstede, he is basically a psychologist, right? So when he was working in IBM, there was a study which involved over one lakh people from 50 countries and three regions. Now, this is like a research study a practical research study wherein the study had made significant contributions by identifying four important dimensions of national culture. But technically speaking, here we have several dimensions. If you look at here, these points below, starting from power distant index to indulgence versus restraint, we have totally six dimensions. Okay. But here, according to this particular gentleman, we, he says that he has found out first four dimensions and the next or the fifth dimension is related to Confucianism, dynamism, 
that is also one more element or dynamics which was included in this particular theory or say model okay so let us discuss these dimensions in detail fine so the original theory which was pro which proposed four dimensions along with which we have cultural values so that these cultural values can be properly analyzed on the basis of these dimensions okay the first is called as power distance index now power distance index is basically a dimension which basically discusses about the significance influence of power which is nothing but we refer to the concept of power and to what extent people have an equal distribution of power that is what is your power distance index all about now here accordingly we try to categorize two extreme set of people with special reference to this particular dimension first is large power distant culture people and the second category is small power distant culture people now what is the difference between these two when we talk about the first one that is large power distant culture people here power is concentrated at the top in the hands of very few people it's like there are few prime authorities and people who are going to centralize all of the powers in their own hands and whatever they say will be the way in which things have to take place in a particular cultural setup or a framework on the contrary when we discuss about small power distant culture it simply means that here power is equally distributed among all the members of the society breaking the concept of centralizing power in the hands of you and the structural hierarchy now that is the first dimension okay the second dimension is individualism versus collectivism now here we simply refer to two types of cultural dynamism that takes place between people belong to a particular culture and its comparison to other cultures also in terms of its implications okay so the first is individualism so it is very obvious from the phrase itself we can understand what it is right so individualism is nothing but it is referred to as the extent to which people prefer to take care of themselves and their immediate families wherein they give more importance to independent and self living kind of a structure where they do not want to be a part of any group or organization they just want to seclude themselves and they just keep to themselves and take care of their own immediate requirements okay one more thing that we must understand is under those people who follow individualism are basically those people who seek and protect their own interest over the common goal of the society and also they don't play a very vivid role or a bright role in the active functional aspect of a society which means they do not participate or they do not take uh, give importance to actively participating as a member belonging to a particular society instead they focus more on being more independent and individual in nature fine that is all to do with individualism whereas on the contrary we have something called as collectivism now what do we mean by collectivism here collect in in people or say people who follow collectivism culture are basically those people who always tend to belong to a particular group wherein they want to have a kind of a bond or a rapport or a relationship where every single person who belongs to that particular group looks after each other in exchange for loyalty so the concept of affiliation is something which is highly valued for people who follow collectivist or collectivism culture fine and one more thing is that collective cultures usually do not allow the freedom of independence okay because they always go with v approach rather than i approach so everything should be handled on a very group kind of a format rather than a single or an individual format fine so that is what happens in collectivist cultures and one more thing is that here we always look at things in terms of how a decision or an activity can benefit the mass and not how it benefits an single person or an individual fine so that is about individualism versus collectivism the third dimension is going to be about 
masculinity versus femininity so here we are referring to the work quality of men and women so what do we mean by this let us discuss in detail so when we refer to masculinity dimension it simply means that those people who feel that masculine dimension is very closely related to the concept of achievement motivation see people who follow this particular dimension always assume that see a person's strength is purely determined based on achievement motivation and orientation he or she has okay so a masculine culture is basically nothing but a society which is driven by the rewards and recognition that has been upheld based on what you achieve in terms of the performances that you exert okay that is what is understood as masculinity so it is purely to do with achievement motivation where things are being cornered upon just one element that is the success or the recognition is something which you get from others based on where you stand and how you contribute to the society in terms of your performance and your actions so more to do with like a fatherly figure where this person has certain tasks to be done he takes care of resources and he handles situations well that is what we refer to as masculinity and the on the on the contrary we also refer to one more term called as femininity femininity is nothing but it is that culture where people tend to emphasize the quality of the whole life rather than just money or success or performance or recognition or rewards or social status and the role of people played in the society which means in other words it is more to do with a motherly side where a mother looks at things in a very balanced manner it is about all the things which is being put together and that is what becomes the way in which you handle situations in the culture or in the society at large which is nothing but they are willing to reach out to the underprivileged and share their wealth with them which is nothing but people who come under femininity are basically those people who take the position of mothers where they are ready to share give support and help people who are in need of certain basic resources now that is what we understand by the second one that is femininity in contrast with masculinity and the next element is going to be uncertainty avoidance index okay now uncertainty avoidance index is nothing but sometimes people want to avoid uncertainty uncertainty means risks which cannot be seen any form of risk which is going to come tomorrow which you are going to face such people who avoid it those people can come under uncertainty avoidance index because they feel that uncertainties can have a negative impact and can actually put them to test which is not so good for them and they don't want to go through that strenuous process that is what is understood by uncertainty avoidance so in simple words if i have to say the uncertainty avoidance dimension basically refers to the extent to which people feel comfortable when they are exposed to an uncertain situation it can be comfortable or uncomfortable right so what is the extent to which people feel comfortable in a very uncertain situation it is it going to be highly comfortable or moderately comfortable or highly uncomfortable that is the three degrees of comfortability that we see under this particular dimension now again here to make our study more specific we categorize people into two extremes under this one particular dimension that is low uncertainty avoidance and high uncertainty avoidance so what is this low and high very simple when we refer when we refer to low uncertainty avoidance people or that particular society they are basically people who are more willing to take risk and appreciate flexibility and informality in the workplace which is nothing but these people who are low which means these people always make sure that they are more willing and more participating to take any kind of risk that may come and they will also appreciate flexibility and adaptability in working 
and also they provide you something called as informality which means they are more flexible they are more relaxable they are more to do with going with the flow in the work spot that is what we see in people who follow low uncertainty avoidance high uncertainty avoidance which is nothing but people here who come under this particular society tend to be more risk averse and favor rigid and formal decision making process in the workplace because they do not want to take up any kind of risk hence they are trying to be very precautious thereby they always go with a very formal approach and they day and they just want to save themselves from any kind of untoward incident that may come up in the future that is what we understand by the two you know extremes under this particular dimension and the next is confucianism dynamism confucianism dynamism is again a simple concept now basically here we are trying to understand this dynamism by looking at the two extremes which can be seen under that one particular dimension okay the first is long term orientation and the other one is short term orientation now what do we mean by this see long term orientation simply means that people always try to go for adapting to you know modern things modern aspects they always go with a lot of ha having a lot of patience and perseverance they always have more they always have something called as concern for you know with respecting the demand of virtue these are certain things which can be seen in people who follow the long term orientation which means they are looking at the long term implications of their cultural aspects and actions which can sustain themselves in a social or a cultural setup or environment on the contrary when we talk about short term orientation here we refer to people who focus more on certain aspects like respect for traditions and then they are always going for quick results orientation and then they are also with concern with possessing the truth which is nothing but here people always are to do with the conventional ideologies where they look up to certain traditional concepts and values and they strongly uphold to these aspects now here long term and short term we discuss under confucianism dynamic dynamism is because sometimes people can enter into this phase of dilemma or confusion where they do not know which orientation that they belong to and how to orient their behaviors and actions and thoughts in a particular cultural environment hence we give this term called as confucianism dynamism and they have two extremes understood and then the last one is called as indulgence versus restraint indulgence means their people who come under this particular culture voluntarily indulge and participate actively in all the act activities or functions that takes place in a active cultural environment or a society restraint people are basically people who restrict their participation with people and they always make sure they do this because they do not want to face the uncertainty that is going to come up as a consequence of their involvement in any given situation with respect to a social or a cultural setup hence we by this finish the first model called as hofstede's cultural dimensions where we identify that there are several cultural aspects or dimensions which has to be you know sensitively or sensitized so that we will be able to sensitively handle situations and also we will be able to survive in any part of the world once we have made a thorough understanding of the cultural dynamics involved in the as in that particular country or nation okay this is all about the first model then see now here this is just to give you an understanding you remember here we told that is derived using the structure derived from factors analysis which is nothing but hofstede is basically he has come up with this particular chart wherein the if you look at the top place right at the topmost section you have 0 and 
right so zero tries to give us clarity regarding the low element or the low space or the low edge towards that particular element that is depicted by zero zero because there is not much of power and there is not much of an activity taking place here and there is no favorability with respect to that particular dimension hence zero and 100 is to say that the focus or favorability of that particular dimension is going to be high extremely high hence we place it with a number called as 100 and this is just to give you clarity in terms of how this has been understood by identifying two extremes for a single dimension that is what we understand with the help of this particular chart and let me tell you students you have to draw this chart in your exam also fine now let us go for the second model the second model was is, is termed as edward t hall study of cultural dimensions so who is this edward twitchell hall t stands for twitchell okay so from may 16 1914 to july 20 2009 okay his tenure was an american anthropologist and cross-cultural researcher so even before delving further let me give you the meaning of anthropology okay so anthropology is nothing but it is a scientific study of humans comma human behavior and societies in the past scenario as well as in the present context so in anthropology we are trying to study human beings evolution their behavior the concept of society and community all of these things are being studied in the subject called as anthropology okay now let me tell you just to give you an add-on anthropology is further classified into three okay one is social anthropology one more is cultural anthropology and the last is going to be linguistic anthropology so social anthropology is nothing but a study of the patterns of behavior of people okay in a social setup or in a societal manner cultural anthropology is something which studies the cultural values norms beliefs do's and don'ts which is nothing but the elements and variables to do with culture and the third is linguistic anthropology which is basically a study of the language and its influences on the social life of people okay so this is just to give you a little bit of clarity about the term anthropology so this person that is edward Wichtel hall is an american anthropologist wherein he is purely to do with study of human beings in terms of culture and so, you know, language uh, social you know, phenomenon and so on and he's also a cross-cultural researcher fine now what is this particular model all about see this person is remembered for developing the concept of proxemics now what do we mean by proxemics see proxemics is also a very important topic that we should be knowing where we are trying to identify proxemics as a concept which discusses about the importance of space space or we call it as privacy that has to be given to people in a social setup when you are made to function as one of the participant in the social environment so here proxemics to be very specific is something where we try to study about aspects like how a person should deal with the amount of space that people feel is necessary to set between themselves and others so it's all about space management right we say right private space you know you don't like people to enter into your private space and similarly you may not do that to them as well so that element of space management is what we understand by proxemics and exploring cultural and social cohesion social cohesion is nothing but how collaboratively and collectively people can survive and sustain in a group format or in a social or in a societal structure and describing how people behave and react in different types of culturally defined personal spaces so people coming from different cultural background will have different orientations towards their cultural spaces or personal space some people feel there should be more personal space coming from one particular culture 
whereas people who come from another particular another type of culture feel that there should be less personal space and they are okay with that right so according to the culture that you come from the element of personal space can vary in high and low degrees accordingly or respectively so here according to this particular person he has come up with certain dimensions or structures as we saw it in the previous model that is hofstede's model okay so what is this that he is trying to give us here there are basically two dimensions but technically we can identify three dimensions okay the first is called as context the second is called as time and the third is called as territorial space okay so let us discuss see students in some textbooks they are just referring to two dimensions that is context and time but in some more you know uh, papers when i studied some more articles when i went through they have also include this territorial space as one more element without which this model is incomplete okay hence i have given you all the three dimensions here fine so even in exam make sure you include all the three dimensions fine okay let us start discussing these dimensions first one context context is nothing but the environment or the surroundings or the situation where interactions take place between people keeping in mind the cultural dynamics okay so here context is further broken down into two extremes that is low context and high context now what is low context low context is basically a context where you see that the focus is more on sending of the message okay the focus is more on sending of the message wherein it is just giving what you want to give or what you want to tell and not looking at what reaction or what impact that your actions have had on the other participants in that cultural framework so what do we see or how do we categorize uh, characterize this particular context in low context we have more verbal communication there is more straightforwardness and there is less misunderstanding because you are making your instructions and your ideologies very clear to people who follow your you know uh, follow your says or your sayings okay now that is what happens in low context now when we talk about high context culture here we specifically refer to a more indirect which means one needs to listen more rather than speaking okay so one needs to read between the lines is what becomes the focal point here read between the lines means see there is a difference between hearing and listening right in the high context culture here the focus is on listening where you keenly observe what people say and accordingly try to come to a conclusion or inference and then try to initiate your actions which is nothing but we have to go for the concept called as read between the lines which is nothing but whatever is being told to you carefully listen and understand what is the essence of that sentence or what is that particular person trying to say and try to capture the feel and emotion also which is involved in that particular discussion okay or in that particular statement so what how do we you know characterize this context so in this context that is high context culture we can find out that there is more non verbal communication and then there is implying of the message in a more indirect method and more confusing manner hence there is more need for us to keenly listen and then try to understand and comprehend what the sayer is trying to tell us okay then the second context uh, and the second dimension is time so what is this time time is nothing but the time in which these interactions take place in a cultural setup fine so here the dimension time is further split into two one is monochromic time and the other is polychromic time now what is monochromic time monochromic time is nothing but you see it says doing one task at a time and paying attention only to that task so simple you see mono and poly mono means single poly means many right so when you do one thing at a time it is going to be more 
relevant and more significant and it occupies clarity in the minds of people who are in that particular process. So here it assumes careful planning and scheduling, familiar Western approach that appears in disciplines such as time management. So one thing at a time is what is being emphasized upon monochromic time. The second is polychromic time, which is nothing but you do many things in that particular time itself, which is actually not going to give you the result that you have expected because it can provide uh, avenues for a lot of confusion and chaos that can potentially take place in the minds of people. So here, lesser concern is given for getting things done and you, you know, taking more time for finishing the task because there is no clarity. There are too many things coming at the same time, which actually puts people into a sense of dilemma where they do not know what has to be taken and what has to be done. Now that is what we see in the polychromic time, fine. And the last dimension is going to be territorial space. Again, this can be stretched into two extremes. That is high territorial space and low territorial space. Territorial space is nothing but the space which people try to take ownership of, which is nothing but the private space or space of privacy that people feel that they should have in a cultural or a group setup. Fine. So what is this high territorial space? So high ter territorial space culture is basically a culture wherein people start taking ownership of everything that comes in that particular space or which falls in that particular space. Okay. So they are highly territorial. They do not expect people to venture into their private space or privacy without their consent. And they can turn up to become very aggressive when such, you know, non-voluntary movement can take place and that can have an impact on their psychology also. The second is low territorial space, which is nothing but people who follow this culture always see that there is, they take less ownership, which is nothing but they do not own anything. They feel that anything and everything in their space belongs to anybody and everybody. So there is this, you know, a very coordinated setup where people collectively accept and survive together, where the concept of ownership of their space or the elements in that space is not something which is obviously seen. It is all to do with giving the space to everybody in a very social structure or in a very social format. Now that is what we understand by low territorial space, right? So these are the three major dimensions that has been contributed by Edward T. Hall in his study of cultural dimensions. And these dimensions have to be properly understood. If not, uh, a person who wants to venture out to a foreign country and start his business for such people when they don't understand these aspects it becomes a big challenge because he or she number one has not understood these dynamics or these dimensions well number two they have not understood the intensity and depth of these aspects and they're causing repercussions in a social or a cultural setup and number three it becomes a challenge because you have not sensitized yourself properly to the situation that is taking place in the overseas markets in terms of their cultural dimensions. Okay. The next is going to be the third model that is globe cultural dimensions. So globe stands for global leadership and organizational behavior effectiveness. So we are looking at companies how companies can set up themselves to become global leaders and how can they achieve this status by having effective behavior practiced within their company. And for this, you need to understand the root cause for behavioral occurrences, which is nothing but cultural implications or to what extent culture and its variable can have an impact on the working psychology of a human being and how that can have an impact on the behavior of people in the work environment, fine. So this concept is basically, they call it as, you know, the brainchild University of Pennsylvania. This person that is Professor Robert J. House is someone 
who's basically found out this concept or who's someone who has come up with this wonderful model fine so what is it that we need to understand in this model see it is a massive and ongoing attempt to develop an empirically based empirically study or empirical study which is based on theory of describe understand and predict the impact of specific cultural variables on leadership and organizational processes and effectiveness of these processes let me break this statement given in very simple words to you okay now here we are just trying to understand that this is going to be a study which is empirical in nature where we are trying to understand certain aspects which have to be considered as important aspects for you to settle down and survive in any given part of the country okay here we are looking at certain aspects like describe understand and predict the impact of specific cultural variables on leadership which is nothing but first describe the cultural variable in understanding the overall aspect of culture or that particular variable of that particular variable second is understand them third is predict the future occurrences of a certain cultural variable and its impact on the leadership effectiveness of people in working organizations okay and we are also going to see how these cultural variables can have impact on the various organizational functions and processes and also the effectiveness of these processes also becomes a matter of study now this is what is the crux of this model called as globe cultural dimensions okay so according to this particular model they have come up with nine cultural dimensions like how we have seen five dimensions and so on so three dimensions and so on so in the previous previous models similarly in this model we have come up with nine cultural dimensions and we are also seeing that how these dimensions can act as factors which can have managerial implications in companies fine the first element or dimension is called as assertiveness now what is assertiveness it is nothing but the degree to which individuals in organizations or society at large are expected to be tough confrontational and competitive in any given situation so assertive is nothing but being very strong headed being very you know confrontational uh, confrontational being you know you always try to take your own stand and you firmly stick on to your stand that is what is understood as being more assertive this is what is the first cultural dimension okay the second is future orientation it is nothing but it is something where it refers to the level of importance a society attaches to future oriented behaviors so we are looking at what is that importance level given to the future oriented actions and behaviors which will be taken up by people now what are these it is nothing but planning and investing in the future and delaying immediate gratification which is nothing but you always try to look and foresee the future consequences and accordingly make a very good plan today which is done well in advance and accordingly try to progress in that particular channel that is what is understood as future orientations so this cultural dimension always has a foreseen thought regarding what can be the implications and consequences of activities and actions that takes place today and for that you must make a proper framework and plan to do it so that you don't end up into a situation which can have a negative impact or an adverse impact on your culture or your survivability fine the third is performance orientation which is nothing but here it tries to focus on giving importance to performance and excellence in the society and refers to whether people are encouraged to strive for continued improvement and excellence in simple words we can say it as performance orientations are basically to do with the performance indicators see people try to measure you based on your performance outcomes your contribution and your excellence that you portray in any given society or a social setup now that is what is being effectively understood as 
performance orientation where the contribution of people in terms of improvement in terms of bringing about change in terms of excellence in doing something all these factors become very important when we we'll discuss about performance orientation fine the next is human orientation in very simple words if you have to say human orientation simply refers to the degree to which individuals in organizations and societies encourage and reward people for being generous caring and kind to others which is nothing but human human orientation is being more organic being more humane in approach where you give more importance to aspects like being more generous caring being more concerned about others feelings and emotions trying to empathize to one situation all these things are being evidently seen in this particular dimension the next is gender differentiation very simple gender differentiation is nothing but it is the extent to which a company or the society at large resorts to role differentiation and gender discrimination now this is something that we are being battling from ages right so this dimension clearly tells us that what is the discrimination that takes place between two genders that is being there in the society and how much of relevance and importance is given to each of these genders on various aspects of cultural dimensions and cultural implications and so on fine and the next is in group collectivism in group collectivism is nothing but the degree to which individuals ex express their pride loyalty and cohesiveness in their organization or families it is nothing but that feeling that people have or that connection that people have when they form a group and when they project themselves as an active member of the belonging to one particular group and this can be evidently seen by the kind of pride and loyalty that these people carry and uphold amongst every single member belonging to that particular group and there's one more to one of a word i used here that is cohesiveness cohesiveness is nothing but how collectively how affiliatedly how combinedly people can survive and sustain cohesively comfortably collectively in a particular group format fine and the next is collectivism so collectivism is also very simple where here we refer to the concept of collectivism as the degree to which organization and society practices encourage and reward collective distribution of resources and collective action so it's all about how do we collectively grow how do we co collectively survive how do we collectively combine coordinate and take up various activities that is going to be done on a very mutual consensual basis okay so in other words we talk about reward collective distribution of resources and collective action now here we are doing things in a very collective collective manner keeping in mind the mass benefit that you can generate and not just taking care of your individual benefits okay so that is what is being seen in the concept of collectivism the next is power distance power distance is nothing but the degree to which organizational members or citizens of the society expect and agree that power should be unequally distributed so that is something very obvious and evident right so the concept of power has been seen we know that power has a very good impact on how relationships work in a within the organization as well as in the society at large and then uncertainty avoidance which we have already discussed in the previous models where we talk about the extent to which members of an organization or the society at large strive work extremely hard to avoid uncertainty by relying on social norms rituals and bureaucratic practices which is nothing but you do not want to take up any sort of uncertainty or a risk hence you stick to your norms rituals and practices so that once you follow these things it means that you are together and you will not face any untoward consequence or any untoward situation which may probably come up in the future now that is what we understand by this particular theory called as the globe cultural dimensions okay model sorry okay the next model is going to be clacon and 
Strodbeck's cultural dimensions. Okay, so what is it that we see in this particular model? The first thing that we must understand is the the uh, the origin and the contributors, right? The the active people who have done this, who have carved out this particular model. So Clacon and Strodbeck's model is based on the initial research which was conducted by Clyde Clacon in the year 1951. Cultural anthropologists like Florence Clacon and Fred Strodbeck in the year 1961 suggested one of the earliest models of culture that has served as a principal foundation for several later models. So it is because of these people, they have given a lot of their insights and effort and their efforts in terms of contributing to this particular area by defining the concept of culture and value, which has been evidently seen with the help of this particular model. So here they proposed a theory of culture based on value orientations. So till now we have not included value as an element under the previous models. It's all about culture, implications, impact, effects, all of these things that we have studied in the previous models. But in this model, there is a change. The change is that the theory of culture is going to be based on the value orientations that people carry upon or the people value most. Okay. They suggested that values in any given society are distributed in a way that creates a dominant value system. Definitely, yes. Values in any given society have to be distributed effectively and also has to be accepted and not rejected. Only then you can create a very dominant value system which has to be in place and that is what is going to you know, uh, determine and that is what is going to regulate the actions, thoughts and behaviors of people belonging to that particular society. Isn't it? The next is again here we have certain dimensions in this model. So what are those dimensions? Number one is nature of people. So according to this dimension, we are trying to understand people, culture and their value system based on the nature of people, which has been derived from the most popular theory, which was given by Douglas McGregor, which is called as McGregor's X and Y theory. So according to this X and Y theory, X represents those people who lack supervision, self-supervision, who lack self-direction, who lack self-motivation, and who needs constant supervision, who needs somebody to always keep them motivated and push them to do something. Such people can come under X. In category Y, we include people who have the traits which are opposite to people falling under the category of X, which is nothing but in category Y, people are more voluntary. They want to take their achievement oriented. They are motivated to excel more. They always want to take up initiatives and contribute much better. They don't prefer people to supervise them. Instead, they are self-supervised, self-monitored, self-motivated and so on. So by this particular theory, we're just trying to categorize that people can technically come under any one of these two categories that is X or Y. Okay. The second dimension is person's relationship to nature. So here we are referring to what is that relationship that a person or an individual can have on the nature or say his nature. Now this can be evidently understood by introducing a concept called as locus of control. Locus of control is nothing but the extent to which people assume control for whatever happens to them as a repercussion or an aftermath or a consequence for their actions, behaviors and choices of these actions and behaviors. To make it very simple, locus of control is nothing but the extent to which people feel that certain aspects control their actions and decisions and thereby having an impact on the consequences occurring as a result of the choice made, made about or say for such actions and behaviors or say decisions. Okay, so now this locus of control is further broken into internal locus of control and external locus of control. Internal locus of control is nothing but, for example, if I have to say, let me say that you have done your exam. Okay, you have not scored well in your exam. Now, internal locus of control says, 
I did not score well because I did not prepare well. Which means you are trying to put you as a cause or reason for whatever consequence has occurred for you. Nothing but your exam result consequence. Okay. On the other hand, when you're talking about external locus of control, you are not taking responsibility of self. Instead, you are shifting that responsibility to somebody else. Okay. You say, see, I did the exam well, but someone has not corrected my script well. So here you are not taking responsibility for your own actions. Instead, you are putting the blame on somebody else for whatever has occurred as a consequence for your action. You are getting my point? So locus of control is nothing but the extent to which people feel what controls their actions and decisions and the consequences of such actions and decisions which can be internal where you yourself personally take responsibility for whatever consequence comes. On the other side, external where you don't take responsibility of self. Instead, you try to pass the buck and say someone else was responsible or some situation was responsible or something like that which has had an impact for this consequence to occur and you don't take that responsibility on yourself. This is called as person's relationship to nature. The third dimension is person's relationship to others where we are talking about the element of hierarchy or respect for seniority that can be seen in any organization or in any cultural and social framework where you always look at the relationship status that is being shared between people based on the role or the position that they hold in any social framework or structure. Modality of human activity is nothing but we are looking at aspects which have to do with self-identification through action and performance. So what do we mean by this? Here we are looking at an aspect of self-identification which is achieved through action or performance which is nothing but see if you want people to recognize you or identify you or set you as an example or a standard for others then it is done based on what actions and performance outcomes you have generated it can be in the past or it can be in the present so based on what contributions you have made people try to describe you or uphold you or value you based on what contributions you have made and not just based on what you are as a personality or an individual that is going to be the third dimension. The fourth is, sorry, the fifth is temporal focus of human activity. Temporal focus of human activity is nothing but we are referring to the decision making capacities of people in a social setup or in a cultural structure. What do we mean by that? See, the decision is being made based on two aspects one is past and the other is future now here we look at two aspects or two performance indicators which will be used as an element to make a decision about a particular person so this is going to be a temporal focus because it is something which is very temporary which is based on the past as well as the future actions or performance outcomes so for example Past performance is less important. There is greater focus on career planning and training, which you can see in that way. But when you look at the future, you look at what consequences your actions can have. And based on that, you are going to give importance on the decisions that you're going to take up. So in other words, we say, if you're talking about past performance, what do we say? Listen students carefully. It may be a little bit confusing, but listen to it now. When I say past performance, it is nothing but based on whatever has occurred in the past, you will take that as an experience and you will use that in terms of planning and training initiatives so that you do not repeat the same mistakes which was undergone or committed in the past. So decision to become perfect based on what has already happened in the past is something which acts as a guideline or a pathway 
for you to better determine your actions and decisions now. Now future oriented is nothing but here we are looking at what is expected to take place. Okay. So based on whatever has happened, you try to project yourself in a better position and accordingly look at what can be done best in the future from whatever you have learned from your past in terms of your observations or your learnings and that is what is going to be used as an indicator to make effective decisions of various aspects governing the activities, functions and tasks to be performed by people in a cultural setup. Fine. And the last is going to be conception of space which is nothing but the concept that we need to understand that what is the degree of importance given by people for their immediate space which can be public space or private space. Public space is when you are okay with people being more being more coordinative and being more near and being more together in the form of a group. Okay. Private is when you feel that you need to be seen as an independent and individual person and you do not prefer to work in groups or in group structures. Okay. And then we go to the last model that is Trompana's cultural dimensions. So what do we mean by this model? What is it that we are going to study about this model? Let us discuss. So Trompana's model of national cultural differences is a framework for cross-cultural communication which is applied to general business and management, which was developed by Fawn Strompenas and Charles Hampton Turner. Okay. Now this involved a large scale. So how was this particular model developed? This involved basically a large scale survey of 8,841 managers and organization employees from about 43 countries. So this is going to be like a survey based study, like a researched effort of these people. That is what has been converted and shaped into a model. Fine. So this model of national culture differences has seven dimensions. Okay. Again here you see dimensions. There are five orientations covering the ways in which human beings deal with other human beings in a confined space or in that particular context, which is dimension one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And then we will have totally seven dimensions. One to five dimension is focusing on this element called as human beings and how they deal with each other. Okay. The second one is going to be, that is the sixth point is going to be about how human beings deal with the environment. And the last seven point is going to do with how human beings deal with the time. Understood, right? With people, one to five point. With environment, sixth point. And with the time is the seventh point. Let us discuss those points now in detail. Look at this. These are the seven points. Okay. So coming to the first one, that is universalism versus particularism. Now here, even before that, let me make it as numbers. So it's easy for you people to look at it. Right. So now it is clear now students. See. Okay. See, the first one is universalism versus particularism. What is this universalism versus particularism? See, these are nothing but cultures. Universalism is one type of culture. Particularism is one type of culture. Let us first discuss about universalism. Universalism is nothing but it is something very similar to collectivism where everything is given more importance, where it is all to do with the combined and collective efforts of people. Again, here we have two extremes. One is high universalism and low universalism. Okay. Now, when we say high universalism, there will be more importance given for formal rules and contracts and to their application regardless of individual circumstances. So when people feel there should be high universalism, they always look at things in a very formal way where every action and decision is being done with the use of formal rules and contracts. Okay. Which is nothing but like an universally acceptable concept for survivability. Right. And in high particularism, we look at the other one. When you're talking about particularism, it means that you emphasize on relationship and trust where you are ready to forego 
or compromise on the rules for benefiting or supporting your friend. Let me make it simple again. Universalism is something where we talk about things which happen, which uphold the values which are derived from formal rules, regulations and contracts which are being created for you to keep things in a very protected and safe and a very formal way. Whereas particularism is, it is going to be your individual particular opinion wherein people who come under this culture dimension sometimes try to compromise on the principles given by the universalism that is formal rules and regulations in order to give importance to social relationship like example is to safeguard your friend you are going to compromise on some rule even if the friend has done something wrong or he has committed a crime or a mistake you are forgoing the rule you are forgetting the rule and then just trying to save him now that becomes particularism just to give you an understanding in terms of the conceptuals okay the second is community sorry individualism versus communitarianism very simple communitarianism culture is something where people regard themselves as belonging to a group like they prefer group cohesion they always want to affiliate with people belonging to that particular group and they always want people to be more you know or mutual uh, more acknowledging more uh, interdependent and interrelated to one another okay whereas when you talk about individualism we refer to people who regard themselves as independent elements and they do not want to be bothered and they do not want to be working in a group kind of a setup okay the third is neutral versus emotional so neutral is nothing but it is that type of a culture in which emotions are not readily expressed in interpersonal communication so neutral is neutrality you can't understand the emotional aspects of people in that culture because they don't explicitly you know express their emotions it is very neutral okay whereas the opposite of that becomes emotional so here what people basically do is in the emotional culture we see that there are people who are characterized by free expression of emotions even in a very business or a formal situation so emotional expression is something which is seen here and in the previous that is neutral you don't see that at all okay the next is specific versus diffuse specific versus diffuse is nothing but we, we first discuss specific okay so in specific what happens we see that this particular type of culture is one in which a distinction is made between work and private life which means people are very specific about what has to be included in their personal life and private goals or personal goals and what is that which has to be done at the in the work goals or work life okay so personal life and professional life has been split into two separate sections okay that is specific diffuse is nothing but you try to work and associate your private life with work which are which in which both of these elements are closely linked to one another and there is a great deal of formality which is maintained across a wide range of social situations which means the the extent to which you connect these two things that is personal life and professional life can have its consequences now what is the consequence you try to bring these formal aspects of behavior and action even to your social setup or your social situation which is going to make the concept of relationship a bit more challenging okay and then we have achievement versus ascription so achievement oriented culture is something where people assume status based on how well they have performed their tasks their level of education their experience and so on whereas Ascription is something where we try to look up to people based on the durable characteristics such as age, kinship, gender and status differences which are mostly seen in people who follow this particular dimension or culture. So status is conferred on the basis. The status that you give or that position that you give to people or place to people is based on the durable characteristics such as their age, 
the kinship that they have come from and then the gender the status these things are being included as important when you discuss the position or the status that you give to people under ascription culture the next is sequential versus synchronic so sequential is nothing but here everything happens based on time orientation dimension okay here this time oriented dimension can be further split into two one is relative importance cultures okay and the other one is going to be things which are to do with minute by minute or hour by hour in a straight line that is time can be structured in two ways in one approach time moves forward second by second minute by minute and in the other we look at it as past present and future occurrences okay that is what we see in sequential the next is synchronic culture in synchronic culture we say that time moves round in cycles of minutes half days years which is called as synchronism synchronism is nothing but how well we synchronize your thoughts and actions according to the changes that takes place in time okay we don't follow a particular sequence but we look at it as individual elements on the basis of cycles of minutes hours days years hours and so on okay then we go to the last one that is internal or external control so internal is nothing but we look at it as people who have a mechanistic view of nature where they always go with a very in a directed focus one's personal focus is all to do with what he personally feels which is very internal and close to his nature okay external is nothing but here people will tend to have a very organic view of nature where they look at it as the obvious ways in which things take place where you personally may not have a control over so external is more organic internal is more restricted and confined and the way in which you want things to happen okay so these are the various dimensions that is the seven cultural dimensions of this particular model so students by this we are done with the first module of international business dynamics and in my next video we will be discussing about the second module of international business dynamics so students hope you have understood all the models if you have any doubts let me know i will help you in understanding them and thank you students